and we're going to read verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. It is the basis for our message today. Well, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, and today we have four candles that have been lighted here on the communion table. These candles, just for review, speak to us of hope, peace, love, and joy. And on Christmas Eve, can you believe Christmas Eve is almost here? On Christmas Eve, we will light the central candle, the most important candle, the Christ candle, which reminds us and speaks to us of the one who was born on that first Christmas. Christmas is a joyful time, but it can also be a stressful time. There's extra cooking, and cleaning, and shopping, and there's a heavy schedule of events, and even family gatherings bring additional stresses, much as we may anticipate them. And then if you turn on the news, you find that the world continues to have trouble, struggle, wars, and rumors of wars. If we're not mindful, Stress may steal our joy. Personally, the idea of shopping in crowded or overcrowded stores gives me what I call Santa claustrophobia. <laughs> <laughs> if you think that your Christmas is stressful, I want you to consider the events associated with that first Christmas. A pregnancy before marriage, a huge tax bill due, a long, difficult journey on foot or maybe by camp, uh, donkey, and the birth of a baby in the unsanitary conditions of a barn. Yet when that baby was born, God's angel made this announcement. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. That's Luke chapter 2 and verse 11. Both Matthew and Luke, in writing the story of Jesus, stress the fact that Mary's pregnancy resulted from the miraculous work of God's Holy Spirit. I want to take you for just a moment to Luke and chapter 1, verses 26 and following. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. You know, when I read that passage... And I think about the angel coming and speaking God's word to Mary. It had to seem impossible. To encourage Mary's faith, the angel told her about her cousin Elizabeth, her older cousin, past the age of childbearing, who had become pregnant. You may remember that that child was John the Baptist. It strikes me that when God wants to do something tremendous, he starts with a great difficulty, such as a woman past childbearing years having a baby. But when God wants to do something absolutely impossible, incredible, History changing. He starts with an impossibility. With God, nothing is impossible. With people, things are impossible. There are things that you and I cannot do. But with God, nothing is impossible. Listen again to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. The Bible specifically connects the Spirit of God with the work of creation. Way back at the very beginning of our Bibles, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God, who created the heavens and the earth, performed another creative miracle by causing a virgin to become pregnant. The Spirit of God is the creator of the world and the giver of life. In Jesus, God's creation came to its absolute pinnacle. God's creative life-giving power came into the world in the person of Jesus. The power of God's Spirit, which in the beginning created life where there was no life, gives us eternal life when we place our faith in Jesus. The fact is that we're not really alive until we have Jesus in our lives. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're not really living. You're just existing. The Bible not only connects the Spirit of God with creation, but with re-creation. The prophet Ezekiel described a valley of dry bones and he tells about these bones coming together and then taking on flesh and skin. And then God asks him, can these bones live? And in Ezekiel chapter 37, I'll just turn to that and read you verse 9. God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. 
So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Now it is worth noting that in both Hebrew and Greek, the languages in which the Bible was originally written, the word for spirit and the word for breath are the same. So this verse could also be read this way. Prophesy to the breath or the spirit, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, spirit, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. When Jesus comes into your life, it is his spirit that infuses you with the life of Jesus. And what is the evidence of the spirit of Jesus in your life? The evidence is the fruit of the spirit, which can come only from a life where Jesus lives. The fruit of the spirit, the Bible tells us, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want you to notice, right after love comes joy. Joy! Right after love comes joy. Loving people are joyful people. Christians, Jesus followers, ought to be the happiest people in the world. Now you may remember that when Joseph learned that Mary was pregnant, he initially intended to divorce her privately to save her embarrassment and disgrace. But then an angel showed up in his dream and explained the situation and said, you were to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus is actually the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua, or more properly pronounced Yeshua. And what does it mean? It means Savior. Jesus, Yeshua, came not so much to be a king as to be a Savior. And from what would he save us? From all sins. This week, I was reading in the 32nd Psalm, and uh, I was forcefully struck by the first verses of this psalm, and I want to just read them with you this morning. It says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And what is the result of confession and forgiveness and release from guilt? The last verse of the psalm says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. When we confess our sin to God, God forgives our sin and removes our guilt. The Bible says that we are Justify. That's a theological word that means just as if I never sinned in the first place. That's what it means. Now, through the years, it has been my privilege to see a, a lot of people come to faith in Jesus Christ, confessing their sins, accepting Him as Savior. Confessing our sins involves a spiritual struggle. It's not something that we come to easily. It's a hard thing to do. To admit that we've done wrong and we can do nothing about it on our own. To admit that we need help, that we need someone to take our place, to pay our penalty. Confession is hard. When we surrender, 
When we say, yes, God, I recognize that I have sinned against you. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me and came to life again. Thank you that my sins can be forgiven. When we get to that place where we accept Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord, the joy that comes into people is absolutely incredible. You just see eyes brighten as they never have before and smiles on faces that transcend anything that they've ever smiled before. The Spirit of Jesus comes into your life and you have joy. Even in times of struggle and stress. And yes, even in times of loss and grief. The fact is, you may have discovered this. And if you haven't, you will. <coughs> Sometimes Christians lose their joy. Lose their zest for living. Their joy seems to ooze away and life turns sour. If that's your situation, what do you do? First, check to see if there's any unconfessed sin in your life. Check to see. And how do you do that? You need God's help to do that. Psalm 139 verses 23 and 24 say, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Once you are a believer in Jesus, though you may sin, that does not mean that you lose your salvation. It does mean that until you confess it, that fellowship with your God, that joy that comes from fellowship with Him, that is broken. Unconfessed sin will steal your joy. I would like to just pause right here and have a moment of quietness. And in this moment, I invite you, let's together ask God to search us and know our hearts, to test us, to look at our thoughts, and to see if there's any offensive way in us. If he shows you something that needs to be made right between you and your God, right now in the quietness of this moment, confess it to him and receive his forgiveness. When you do wrong, get in the habit of confessing quickly. As soon as God brings to your attention that you have done wrong, whether it be a thought, a word that you've spoken, an action that you've taken, as soon as the Spirit of God makes you aware of that, confess it immediately so that your joy can be restored. And having checked to see if there's unconfessed sin in your life, the second thing I would ask you is check that you are living according to God's divine order. And what do I mean by that? Put Jesus first and the interests of others ahead of your own. Don't ask, what's in it for me? What will I get out of it? Put Jesus first, others second, yourself third. Jesus, then others, then you is a wonderful way to spell joy. One man put a little sign on his office desk as a personal reminder. He just said, me third. This Christmas, put Jesus first in your life. Put the interests of others ahead of your own. And you will discover the joy of the Lord is your strength in a stressful time. We pray. Father God, thank you. 
for your full and free forgiveness through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that the baby who came into that world as a miracle of your Holy Spirit at the time of the very first Christmas became our Savior. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood so that our sins could be forgiven. And he came back to life again. And as we place our faith in you and receive your forgiveness, we too have life. And that's a joyful life. An abundant life. An eternal life. Jesus, we love you. Because you loved us first. May your love Blow through us to others so that we become lights in this world. Help us to bless others in new and exciting ways through this Christmas season. By the power of your spirit within us. Amen. Let's join